Hey team, you're about to experience my interview with Jorit Steins. Jorit is the founder and CEO of Channel Engine. Channel Engine is an omni-channel e-commerce connector for e-commerce brands that allows them to connect their e-commerce platform into all of the international sales channels that they want to sell through. These sales channels are channels like e-commerce marketplaces, e-commerce pricing comparison websites, social shopping platforms, and the like. We had a fantastic conversation about the opportunity that merchants have to connect to a global digital marketplace in an easy and seamless way. Enjoy. This is the e-commerce edge podcast with your host, Jason Greenwood. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the podcast. It is my pleasure to welcome Jorit Steins from Channel Engine. Welcome, Jorit. Thank you for having me, Jason. Looking forward to yeah. it. My pleasure to have you along for the ride today. And we were talking off air about just how small and tight knit the tech and in particular the e-commerce ecosystem is. And I mentioned that, that I had someone else from the Netherlands on the pod yesterday for a recording. And you said, not only do I know them, but we have some joint technology work we do together. So very small world, isn't it? It is. Yeah. And I saw you started out in New Zealand. I started out in Australia exactly the same time with e-commerce. So looking forward to this exciting uh, conversation. Absolutely. Me too. And before we get into Channel Engine and what you guys do and how Channel Engine came to be, because you've been doing this for almost a decade now with Channel Engine, CEO and founder of Channel Engine. And when we look back across your background, obviously heavily invested in tech, in e-commerce, but also heavily invested as an investor. So founder and investor of VC funds, been an angel investor and an advisor before as well. So what if, if we take the elevator pitch of your journey to get to where you are today, how did you get to be in the space? Actually, the, the common thread is technology. And I think and the first thing was my dad bought a computer when it was still DOS, C double point, and then that the computer broke. It's doing nothing. And then I found a book called Basic, and I think I was 10 years old, so I started programming. So it always captured my attention. But in the end, after high school, went to university, did mechanical engineering, and always that technology side and automation uh, pulled my interest. So I started doing production automation, and that was in the period when the internet came up. So that match between software development, automation, doing things efficiently because I learned all about efficient um, manufacturing and stuff like that, that tied into the birth of, uh, of e-commerce. So I started building the first e-commerce shop in 2001, I think. Just Googled how it worked, built the first e-commerce store and then jumped in from there because there was no good solution back then. So I started a company called Website Lease, which was fixed monthly fee for a website or web shop. Now we all call it SaaS. Back then there was no term called SaaS. So started building e-commerce stores for smaller merchants, bigger merchants. One of our customers was a great guy straight out of college, started a gadget house store. We decided to launch a few stores together, ran a bit out of hand. And in the end, we had 75 e-commerce stores. 30,000 SKUs in stock, built our own warehouse management system, launched new sites, doing search engine optimization, launched the marketplace, started selling on marketplaces, and that all led into what we're doing now with the, with Channel Engine at a way larger scale than we did before. Oh, wow. Okay. So yeah, this is definitely going back. Anybody that has been in our industry for over two decades, like the two of us, there's not a lot of us around, and definitely it feels feels like those of us that have been doing this for 20 plus years, we feel like <laughs> unicorns in a way and showing our gray hairs. But look, it's an exciting space to be. And like you, I guess I did something similar. The first agency role that I ever had, which was how I got into this game to start off with, they also had their own SaaS platforms. They didn't call them SaaS. They just called them I don't even remember exactly what we called them. I think we just called them vendor hosted or something like that. Like yeah. it was just, we had a CMS platform and we had an e-commerce platform that was hosted 
by our agency slash we were a hosting company, a web hosting company. That's what our agency sprung out of. Yeah. But in addition to hosting of other people's software and technologies on our infrastructure, we also had our own software that people subscribe to. And so it was SaaS. So like they just paid a monthly fee to access our software through a browser. They could set everything up through a browser. They could set up all their content through a browser. You could set up your domain name at the at basically on top of our software so that we, we had a really basic, simple admin interface for administrating our two pieces of software, which were e-commerce and, and, and content. And what people would do is they would, if they wanted to do content and commerce, then they would just simply have a navigation link from our e-commerce system into our content system. And that's how you accessed the content system on a subdomain. And we yeah. would just link out, like we would either have a blog or we'd have info or we'd have whatever, and it would just link out to the URLs on the content system. So really this was very early days of this whole concept of SaaS. But even then I realized the benefits of SaaS because I didn't know what the concept of vendor hosted software even was. Like when I started there, <laughs> When I started with this agency, I, I didn't realize that existed. I was into computers. I was into Linux. I was into setting up my own software, setting up my own servers, just at a basic level. I was like, like I wasn't, I didn't, I don't have a computer science background or anything like that, but I was just, I was really technical and I just loved digging into the guts of how computers worked, how operating systems work, how file systems worked, how file transfer protocols worked, how all that stuff worked. It just interested me. And that's where it so, all starts. Yeah, yeah right, they're just an interest, passion, right? A passion. Searching for new technology. That's always what I look for in, in our teams as well. I always ask, what did you develop just for fun? And if yeah. I see these eyes light up and they start talking about it, and sometimes you have these people, oh, for university, I did this. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for that eagerness and that drive to figure out new stuff because everything is changing so rapidly. If you don't have that drive, you're not going to go far. You just won't love it enough to deal with the pain, right? Like oh, I remember back in the, I mean, I remember back in the day, this self-hosted software company, this SaaS hosted software company, we then as an agency, we then got into building e-commerce websites on OS commerce. And of course, the, we hosted them, we hosted those sites on our own infrastructure as well. And so they would pay us to develop their e-commerce websites. Prior to that, we were actually sharing office space with a bespoke software development house that specialized in e-commerce, and every single site they built was bespoke. And it was crazy how common it was back then for e-commerce websites to be bespoke built. Everything was completely custom, and these guys were building almost every single e-commerce website they built was built in Flash. All 100% built in Flash. Oh, wow. And early killed. days. Yeah, and, then, <laughs> and of course, that got killed off. And then, you know, sites built in frames become very, became very common until we realized it whole, breaks the whole URL <laughs> modality. I can't send links to my friends. That, that didn't work. And so we realized, geez, okay, we can't build software that renders everything in frames anymore because it breaks the entire concept of the hyperlink on the internet. So if we go back to those really early days, the way I think about how our industry has evolved is that literally every single thing we did back then was difficult. There was nothing easy yeah, ab about e-commerce back then. There was no such thing as an omni-channel platform that made connecting your backend systems, your ERPs, whatever the systems you might be running at the time with front-end sales channels. There was just, it totally. just didn't exist. And I'm guessing that now that you've been doing this- We built basically... everything ourselves back then because there was yeah. always commerce, but it wasn't sufficient. So we built everything, one system, one database that ran 75 e-commerce stores, connections to suppliers, warehouse management system. Everything was built from scratch because it wasn't there. And now there's, it feels like there's almost a SaaS piece of software to do absolutely everything. And I'm guessing yeah. that's where Channel Engine sprung out of is, hey, we had to build this. We don't understand what this looks like. We don't want people to go through the pain that we went through. So we're going to make this a commercially available piece of SaaS software. T totally. And, and that was with all the learnings from the years before. We wanted to set out with a platform that's very scalable and has a management layer in between because we had direct connections, custom built into marketplaces, but then the commercial team didn't have the optionality to do, to filter on different products that were, should be excluded from marketplaces, optimize pricing, do content mapping because the source of the data is always different than what a marketplace needs. So that's why I wanted a, an operating system that does that. 
and then basically also just one plug. So you integrate once with your backend system, and then you're done. And then General Engine takes care of all the other connections, which was a fun ride to build all these other connections. At the moment, we have more than 700, so I keep them up to date. Yeah, and look, I think that just for the sake of people that maybe don't necessarily know what an omni-channel listing engine or omni-channel connector engine is and how it functions, Really, you operate as a piece of middleware technology that allows brands to connect. Let's say they've got an ERP system, and that's the source of their core product data, or maybe they have a PIM system, a product information management system, or maybe their their PIM is their e-commerce platform. So they've got the most enriched data for all of their products sitting in their e-commerce platform, which a lot of brands do, right? They get maybe yeah, base correct. information from an ERP, the SKU, the name of the product, maybe a short description, inventory and price. Maybe those are the four or five core pieces of data that come from an ERP. And then in their e-commerce platform, they're add, they'll add all of the other rich information, rich data, the product attributes, long descriptions. They'll add videos. They'll add all their images. They'll add all maybe some PDFs, maybe some tech documents, etc. They'll add all that stuff directly in their e-commerce platform to enrich that product and make it consumer-friendly on their e-commerce platform. But then all of a sudden, and usually very quickly after a brand sets up their own e-commerce platform, they realize, hang on a second, I might want to list on Amazon. I might want to list on eBay. I might want to list on Zalando or Wayfair. We've got, we now got marketplaces for B2B. We've now got marketplaces for B2C and D2C. And we've got hybrid marketplaces that kind of cover both. And then we've got regional marketplaces in virtually every country around the world. Like I'm based in Mexico now and Mercado Libre is huge here. They're number two behind Amazon in Mexico. And then we've got Copal as well, which is a huge retailer. I think they do something like $9 billion a year worth of products here, and you can sell through them as well. So we've got global marketplaces. We've got vertical specific marketplaces. We've got business model specific marketplaces, and then we have regional marketplaces. So we've got this proliferation. I think there's something, as you said, you've got 700 connectors now. There is virtually a marketplace or a unique selling channel for every single merchant in the world. And to try to build out connectors so that you can get that product data into those channels is a nightmare if you're doing them individually. Yeah, and it's not just about getting the products on these channels. It's then doing the full automation of your e-commerce because you have a central warehouse and then you need to make sure the stock is updated to this marketplace. You sell something in one marketplace. We need to take it off the other marketplace. Maybe you're using fulfillment by Amazon in combination with your own warehouse and do that across multiple geographies multiple languages, make sure the prices are up to date because every country, every marketplace has different competition on the platforms. And then for some of our customers have hundreds of thousands of products. Go try to do that with by hand. <laughs> it's impossible <laughs> to do it. Not only that, but as you rightly point out, I think one of the other challenges is not every brand wants to list every single product that they carry on every single marketplace. No, and so totally. they will have a curated catalog. They'll have basically a subset of their products that they want to list on marketplaces. So it might only be 50%, it might only be 25% of their products that they want to list on marketplaces. Yep. Then you have channel specific strategies, i.e. you might have specific pricing strategies, you might have specific volume strategies that are unique to each individual marketplace. And then beyond that, if I'm selling on say Mercado Libre in Mexico, but I'm selling on Amazon in the United States, I may want my inventory, depending on which channel those orders are secured through, to be routed to different warehouses yep. for fulfillment. Correct. But I also want all of that two-way flow of information. I want to send the product information up, but I also want to pull the order information down. And then I want to push the shipment information back up to the marketplace. And it all has to be automated because there's no way you're going to be able to maintain that kind of catalog and that kind of order management workflow. You're never going to be able to do that manually, right? No, cor correct. That's why we build it. And the, the idea... Sounds simple when you explain all the intricacies of what's going on in the background. You know how complex it can be, but you can do it at scale once it's integrated, once you have that control panel, and then across multiple geographies. I've got one customer, I think they've got a team of two, and they're doing 60 marketplaces with a massive number of, of sales each month just with That's... two people. And then it just streams into their normal D2C operations. And the other thing, what you said, is you, you want to make that selection. You want to be in control as a brand, what you sell, where and why. 
based on profitability. Maybe you want to prioritize a certain set of uh, inventory for your DTC shop. Maybe you want to dump overstock in a certain market where you're not active with your D2C. But we see a lot of brands also active both as a vendor as well as a seller on a marketplace. So you want to balance that out, make sure you only sell the items that are not on vendor, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it can be super complex, but if you have the tools to manage it well, you can do it. And one of the other challenges that I see a lot of brands facing in this area is 1P versus 3P sales as well. And they might be connected to a given marketplace like an Amazon. They might be selling some products 1P and they might be selling other products 3P. And so they still have to get their inventory in, but, the, but they're effectively two different connectors to the same yeah. marketplace because of the way that the marketplace is actually buying and representing the product as if it comes from them in a one P scenario, first person, you know, first party seller scenario. Whereas in a third party seller scenario, you're effectively just using them to list your products for sale. And so it really starts to get pretty complex pretty fast. And there's other marketplaces that have adopted that Amazon model where they have a dual, they have almost like, they almost have a bipolar model where in some instances, the marketplace buys the products from you and sells them directly to end consumers. Uh, and in other cases, there's simply a channel where you can list your own products, almost almost like a, w- what we have in New Zealand is we have Trade Me, right? And yeah. they're a pure third-party marketplace, but really what they are is they're, they started out life as a pure auction website, which is actually how a lot of these marketplaces did start out. If we look at, if we look at eBay, they are still a hybrid marketplace combined with an auction website. There's some things that get sold yeah. for a fixed price brand new by manufacturing brands or distributors or wholesalers. But then we also have a scenario where people are selling used goods in an auction type scenario. So we have, we, I guess we have marketplaces that take many yeah. different forms and they all and have, have unique complexities. Yeah. And then you have marketplaces that also sell refurbished items, specifically refurbished MacBooks, iPhones, at massive amounts. And the other thing you said is you see that shift from vendor to seller. I see that accelerating in the last couple of months, last year, because money is expensive. So people, all these retailers don't want to have these products on the balance sheet. So they're shifting all the brands to the seller model. But typically they pick and choose the best selling items they're gonna buy as a, in the vendor model, and then they open up the marketplace for the rest. So if you want to be in control as a brand and you want a full collection on that platform, whether it's a retailer that became a marketplace or whether it's a normal marketplace like Amazon or Walmart, you need to have that optionality to shift that. Because we've seen it as well that marketplace stop sending in purchase orders through 1P. And if you don't have that route to market on 3P, then you don't, just don't sell. Yeah, you, you don't have any routes to market. You can't get yeah. in front of your customers. And then we have a scenario where also a lot of these marketplaces, well, there's two things I'm seeing play out, and, I, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this. We're seeing the the largest retailers in the world that were pure retailers, right? And they want to offer endless aisle. They want to play in categories that they don't want to stock inventory in. They don't want to deal with logistics. They don't want to, as you say, have any inventory on their balance sheets. And one of the quickest ways to do that is to add in effectively multi-vendor marketplace functionality to their existing yeah. e-commerce website or to have that separate, like basically a separate button where it says it'll say market buy and then it'll say their brand name, right? So it, it gets the benefit of all this traffic. And where we often see this being successful is brands like Meyer, for example, in Australia, where they are one of the largest retailers in the country. They're a department store chain, but they've also got their online website. But... They still don't want to get outside kind of their core market of homewares, home furnishings, clothing, all the stuff that they would normally sell as a standard department store, cosmetics, et cetera. But they want to be able to supply virtually everything that you would use in your home, outdoor furniture, et cetera. But they don't necessarily want to warehouse and ship those products. And so it's far easier for them to create a marketplace backend that their suppliers can connect directly to. They can monetize There are millions of site visitors per month. They can monetize them in new ways by effectively becoming the seller of record, but then that order gets routed to the ultimate supplier who ships direct to consumer. And so we're seeing a lot of these hybrid models become the norm, aren't we? Yeah. That's why we have so many channels. So it's not just uh, the well-known Amazons and Ebays. It is these retailers that became a marketplace. It's social media that became a marketplace. It's everything is becoming transactional because everybody that has traffic on their website wants to keep the user there 
wants to service them with the right products. So that's why it's getting more complex for brands to do this, to manage all these channels at scale in different geographies. And each market is a little bit different as well. So marketplaces are very similar, but if you go into Southeast Asia, everything is promotion driven. You need to work with coupons. Everything is, we just had 10, 10. It's always 9, 9, 10, 10, 11, 11, all eight, these, eight. Eight, eight, all of them. And, and the rest of the month, you, you hardly sell anything. And then there's a huge peaks. But if you don't know that, then you're missing out. And then 1010 was almost colliding with Prime Day. So it's always interesting to see that across the globe. And we see all these revenue streams from our brands coming in. And you, you see all kinds of patterns. But it's good to, to know what your op- opportunities are in all these regions. And how did you decide ultimately that this was a space that you felt like you could win in? If we log into the Shopify app marketplace, the app store, you'll see between 20 and 30 omni-channel listing tools, similar to yours, but maybe different to yours. There was always, even when you guys started out, there was Channel Advisor and there was probably two or three major channel listing engines and channel management. Really what you are is your channel management engine more than anything yes. else. And Correct. you started out in a market that already had quite a bit of competition in it. And that competition has only increased over the last decade. So what made you think, A, the world needs another channel management engine because the ones that are out there aren't doing what I need them to do? And B, how did you think you could compete against some fairly well-entrenched competition and differentiate yourself from the other players in the market? Yeah, so when we started off, there wasn't that much around, but these pure plugins, listing management tools, they were missing the functionalities we needed. We needed full automated repricing. We needed to balance inventory between the different channels we had. We started in Europe, and in Europe, you've got all kinds of complexities ranging from VAT to translations to logistics to which warehouse do you use for which currencies. So it's way more complex than that. And then I started thinking the whole market is shifting from local retailers that sell on local marketplaces to brands that need to control this at a global scale. And doing this at a global scale, there are not many companies doing it. So that's why we set out to build the biggest global e-commerce network with where Channel Engine is the operating system to do that. Uh, of course, Channel Advisor was around, a totally different type of company, uh, started as an agency, started with technology, and they tried to be it all themselves. And we started out with a core technology and a network where we have a huge ecosystem of partners that can benefit from working with Channel Engine as well. And we cannot do everything ourselves. We are very good at building software technology. We know marketplace, we know the strategies and stuff like that. We've got a huge agency network around us. We build a global fulfillment network because if you're a brand in the US, you want to come to Europe, then you need a merchant record like Operator One, which you interviewed, or there are quite a few of those, but you need the right one. You need logistics, so we're pre-connected into all kinds of 3PLs that can do the logistics for you. So we are building that ecosystem. That's what I love to do. And that's a different way of building a company. So it's not just connect the API. We also build relationship with the marketplaces because if you really want to have it work well, we need to look at white spots on those marketplaces, what brands can work well on those marketplaces. And if something goes wrong, you've been in technology for a long time, then you need that connection personally as well, not just technology. Uh, and that's where we come in. So I always say we're not just connecting systems, we're connecting people that happen to work at companies. And that's what we're doing at scale worldwide. And there's no other company I'm aware of that's doing it at the scale we are doing it and building these relationships and building these routes to markets and providing access for a brand to go into new regions where maybe never dreamt of going into. And then without building their own infrastructure, they can just rely on our partner network. And they still have the flexibility. If you go into Australia, we've got three or four, three PLs they can choose from. They signed a contract with that partner, but that partner has an integration with Channel Engine already. So that makes it easy and scalable. And of course, we talked about Shopify. They have a massive ecosystem around it. We're like that, but then more focused on the mid-sized to enterprise brands that want to tackle this internationally. And we talked a little bit about, obviously, all of the places we need to send data to, but there's almost as bewildering an array of systems and technologies that we need to get data from. So it's not just your traditional ERPs, although there's many of those as well. There's probably, in the retail space alone, there's probably 10 very well-known, very well-used, very well-deployed ERPs, obviously your NetSuites of the world, obviously your Bright Pearls of the world, your Sin7s of the world. There's 
Dynamics 365. You've got a lot of common. Then you have some very vertical specific ERPs for the likes of fashion businesses and other businesses that really they're an ERP hybrid with a point of sale system. We've got a lot of systems that where brands will have all of their enriched data, maybe not in their ERP, but it might be live in their point of sale system. And yeah. be, so that their sales people in store have all of the information to hand to be able to talk to consumers about and be able to print off point of sale uh, information for when they're putting up their end caps and everything else. Then we have other systems. We've got product information management systems where all of that enriched data lives before it goes out to all of those disparate and distinct channels that we've been talking about. We've got we've just got a bewildering array of source systems for this data, yeah. right? We've got even got PLMs. We've got product lifecycle management systems where a lot of this data originates before it even hits an ERP or a PIM or an e-commerce website. And, and so we have Excel. <laughs> yeah, we've got spreadsheets and, and Google Docs, which which oftentimes you have to connect to Google Docs API to get product information out of. So it's it yeah. feels a bit chicken and egg for platforms like yours. It's it's great if you can send information out, but if you can't get information in, then you it's don't both. have a complete system, right? It's definitely both. So we build a solution where you can have any combination of ERP, BIM systems, even sheets out of Google Sheets, and then merge that into uh, your product data. So typically there's the basic data coming from out of ERP. Sometimes they have an additional feed out of a BIM system or they can push it through an API. And then you have this complete data. Many times we are missing translation. So we push it into translation engines, get it translated back into our solution. Sometimes they don't have the ability to create virtual bundles, which is very good to provide profitable sales on marketplaces. So we created that in channel engine. So we've got a massive amount of connections on the back end, whether that's ERP, PIM systems, warehouse management systems, but also we're connected into iPaaS solutions that again have a lot of connectors as well to make sure we can connect to basically anything. And then that combination is essential and we see new use cases continuously. So some of our customers are using, or, or more and more of our customers are using Channel Engine to not only manage their marketplace, but also their D2C store. So. Shopify is a channel, BigCommerce is a channel. So Channel Engine can manage and optimize all the backend routing of stock inventory res reservations uh, to the right warehouse. Uh, a new use case are coming up. A customer in Southeast Asia is using it for their POS systems, feeding all their orders through our system. Um, we just heard a new use case they're building in the Middle East where we're connecting into shopping malls where they want to do the drop shipment for customers that have that different size and wasn't in stock. So there's so many use cases for this information flow back and forth in the orders. And I think you raise a good point, which is that a lot of brands, when they come to me for consulting, they will struggle to understand the difference platform, the iPaaS platform, and a platform like yours. They will struggle to understand where in their tech stack each of those systems play a role and plug into other systems. And the way I like to describe it, and I'd love to get your take on this, which is probably why you've connected to some of these middleware platforms. And I'm speaking just for anybody that's wondering, I'm thinking of platforms like Linworks, like Patchworks, like Celigo. There's a lot of these middleware platforms. And what they are designed to do is to be an internal traffic cop of data and connectors that translates and has a certain amount of business logic and mapping capabilities to get data from one internal system to another internal system. But they are not designed to then send data to external third-party systems. That's not what they're designed to do. They are an internal tool that allows a brand, for example, to connect their ERP system to their PIM system to their e-commerce platform. But those or have to no engine. Or to, to Channel now, Engine, now. but they have no vision of the third-party world. They have no out-of-the-box connectors to the likes of marketplaces or social channels or anything like that because that's not what – they're not designed to do those things. They're not designed to have that kind of business logic. They're not designed to be a light PIM system like platforms like your, yours are. And so the type of business logic that lives in an internal middleware platform is totally different to the business logic that lives in a yeah. system like yours, right? Yeah, t totally. So it's a different logic, but it's also the control panel and basically the operating system 
So what Channel Engine does is it allows you to have full visibility on all these marketplaces. What are you doing in your e-commerce sales? You see the orders flowing through. You can optimize pricing. You can do competitive analysis and basically everything you need to do for e-commerce at scale. And that's missing in those tools. That's why they're awesome to partner with and to extend. And some of these iPaaS solutions make a connector to Amazon, but then you are missing these tools to, to manage your business on profitability, on price optimization, competition. And we are purely focused on doing e-commerce at scale on multiple platforms, which means we can focus all our development attention to do just that for many years. And it's a different focus and you cannot be at all. And to a degree, you in some select instances, not every instance, but in some instances, you can be a replacement for one of these internal middleware platforms. Because, for example, let's say you've got an out-of-the-box connector with their ERP. You've got an out-of-the-box connector with their e-commerce platform. Now, normally, you would be getting data from their e-commerce platform, but it's just the reverse that happens when you need to push data into their e-commerce platform. So in some small, narrow use cases, if it's purely focused on e-commerce, yes, or retail orders, definitely, Yeah, so I, I could see a scenario where you can get product data out of their ERP. They could do a certain amount of, uh, of enrichment in your platform, almost like a light PIM is the term I would use. And then that finalized data set could be selectively sent out to their Shopify site, for example, and then yep. also to Amazon. So whilst you are not, you don't sell yourselves as that internal middleware platform connector system, that's not what you sell yourself as. There are use cases where it would make sense for that's yes. if it's a fully retail focused brand, it makes sense for them to look at consolidating their middleware technology into one tool if they can and if it makes sense to do so. Yeah, totally. And and how often do you see yourself being brought in to merchant environments where maybe they're using an internal middleware platform today and you say, look, we could connect to that middleware platform because we've got a connector out of the box to a Linworks, to a Patchworks, whatever. Or based on what we see in terms of your internal endpoints that you need to get data to, we feel like we can do it all. If you want us to, we can do it all and we can replace that existing middleware platform. How often do you come in and do that versus connect to an existing middleware platform? It totally depends on the architecture of the IT landscape of the customer. Uh, because typically their middleware is doing other stuff as well for the point of sales systems. But sometimes even huge companies uh, are replacing their full tech stack. Uh, for instance, uh, Verzuni, which is uh, Philips Domestic Appliances, is using us to power their DTC store and their marketplaces in all kinds of regions from Europe to Southeast Asia to US. And they're connecting directly into SAP and we're doing the rest. So we're extending SAP to basically the whole world. So that's an ideal case. But many times, if they already have a middleware layer, we can connect to that. that. That's totally fine. And I guess what this does is it allows a brand to start ferreting out some of their technical debt within the business. Because what I've seen oftentimes when I'm consulting and I go in and, and they say, hey, everything from a back office perspective, hey, it's working pretty well. We don't think we need to look at our back office systems. We're really just looking at maybe a replatform of our e-commerce website, or maybe we're looking at maybe just adding a PIM system or something like that. But when we get under the bonnet, we realize that there's a tremendous amount of overlap between some of their internal systems. There's yeah. overlap in cost. There's overlap in complexity. <clears throat> there is m- additional Slow points of failure. synchronization. And there's multiple points of failure that just do not need to be there. And so therefore, sometimes there's a consolidation effort that needs to happen first to simplify the overall architecture, to reduce points of failure, and to also reduce the specializations within the business required to run those individual systems. Because sometimes we have IT team sprawl simply because they have so many systems at play that could be replaced by a singular system or moving from five systems down to two systems or three systems. Anytime we can do consolidation of systems and processes and integration endpoints, that usually results in a more efficient business and a more cost-effective business. Oh, absolutely. And the other thing is that you're empowering the commercial teams. Uh, so what typically used to be like that is all these in-house systems were relying on an IT team that's always swamped. So as soon as Prime Day comes up, somebody in the commercial teams wants to make a change in delivery times or stuff like that. They need to go 
back to the IT team. They don't have time and they're too late. And uh, within Channel Engine, you can just manage it there with all kinds of advanced rules and the commercial team can do it. So the whole idea is that you can configure everything instead of relying on development to do it. So you integrate once, which can be an interesting project to do, and then you're moving uh, to, to the commercial team. So they are in fully control. And obviously, sometimes that's finance, sometimes it's procurement, sometimes it's marketing. It, it is a range of teams that usually need to operate in these systems. And yeah. when they secure a new supply deal, a new supplier deal, then oftentimes procurement is working directly in a PIM system, which then marketing gets involved after the product it hits the PIM system. Then the marketing does their work. And then they, they usually it's marketing that ticks the bu final button that says, okay, this is ready now to be sold because they're the ones mm -hmm. that get to make the judgment call. Okay, this product has enough information that is consumer friendly that a consumer can actually make a buying decision, a shopping yeah. and a buying decision. And then Channel Engine might say, that's not enough for the marketplace because they require more before we push it out and they get an error. And that feedback loop is essential. It, it absolutely is. So I mean, we're, we're talking stage gates of enrichment there that are required by each platform. And if you've got a PIM system, you usually do that in your PIM. But if you don't, then you still have to have some sort of system that acts as a safety net to make sure the products that you're creating can actually be sold in that channel. Yeah, absolutely. And for you guys, when you guys go in and you start scoping out a new project with a new client, do you usually land and expand? Meaning, is it usually, hey, let's just get, so maybe they sell on five marketplaces or 10 marketplaces, and but their biggest marketplace currently is, say, Amazon. Do you go, okay, we're not going to go in and, and bite off the whole thing before we launch. We're going we're gonna to get you connected up. We're going to get you connected to your ERP. We're going to get you connected to Amazon. We're going we're gonna to peel off each one of those independent, maybe point-level connections to a market. We're going to just peel them off one by one yeah. in a systematized process because otherwise it feels like these projects can sometimes be bigger than Ben-Hur. It feels like you're boiling the ocean, and it feels like you're never going to get live. So it feels like peeling these off one by one may feel more digestible to the business. Oh, totally. That we look at the first marketplace, do all the flows work well, and we have a lot of transitions from other homemade integrations from other marketplace integration solutions to us. So we have that, that route to check it. Sometimes you don't even have to take off the inventory of the marketplace. We can just seamlessly take it over, but we do it one at a time. And typically you see the bigger customers saying, oh, awesome, let's make a project plan. And then some smaller customers like, oh, when can we get live next week? Can we do 50 marketplace at the same time? And I don't recommend that route. I can understand. And how often are you called in to also get product information into shopping comparison engines? Because those are also a big deal. They're not necessarily transactional endpoints. But for example, in Australia, get price is absolutely massive. It's almost every country and region has their own shopping comparison engine where you go and you find out pricing information about products that then those engines lead you to the retailer of those products. But they are, they are a massive piece of the ecosystem that possibly doesn't get talked about enough. No, true. We do have data feed management in our solution uh, and we give it away to our marketplace customers because it's an essential part. We don't talk about ourselves as, de as a feed management solution because there's so many out there that also pretend they can do marketplace at scale. So it's, uh, it's something we have. It works super well, and it's, we're, not, we're not pushing that too much. Uh, it's just part of it. Yeah, it's a given and that you need to be able to do that. It's a given and needs to be flexible, and customers can just set it up easily in, uh, in Channel Engine. I do see a lot of comparison sites worldwide transitioning into becoming transactional or becoming a marketplace because it's going to be very hard to add value as a comparison side, basically because if you look at marketplace, they are essentially a big product search engine, comparison side and checkout in one. So we've seen that migration. I think we, back in 2003, we started listing on all kinds of comparison sites, optimizing there, using that for link building, even if it was possible, affiliate marketing. So we don't know data feeds extremely well, but it's just part of it. It's a uh, table stakes. And just as we start coming to the end of our time together, I'd love to get your thoughts on why marketplaces have become so insanely popular the world over. I've got my own thoughts on this, and I'll, I'll throw out one of them out there. I think for me as a consumer, it's probably less about price. Price is only one component of the convenience of shopping on a marketplace for me. When I think of 
creating one single account with Amazon and being able to, because I'm a global world traveler, I've lived in multiple countries around the world, I'll probably live in more countries before I die, one account with Amazon, and I can shop on any of their domains, I can sh shop on Amazon.m from here without creating a new account. I can see all of my purchase history. I can see all my returns history through one portal, one single supplier, if you will. And then on the flip side, when I'm actually making a purchase, I think the other piece around this is that I can buy off of multiple suppliers in a single harmonized both cart and transaction where I get the benefit of, say, for example, a loyalty or a membership platform. I get that across multiple merchants, but through one ultimate supplier and one payment. So for me as a consumer, there is the convenience factor, which in many respects trumps, and the trust factor, which trumps the price factor. The price factor is definitely a, a, a part and parcel of this. Yeah. But A, I can oftentimes get products through marketplaces that I literally cannot find anywhere else. I can buy from multiple vendors at one time with one final checkout and one final payment. And I get the benefits of aggregating my purchases through one supplier. So I, I feel like those are probably like the, the single biggest value propositions. But from your perspective, what do you think has triggered consumers to be so brand loyal to marketplaces as opposed to the brands that they carry? Yeah, I think it's super simple. Uh, when you started asking the question, I was thinking convenience and trust. So e-commerce is all about trust. And convenience, you have one portal where you can just search anything. Your account is already there. But if something goes wrong, they are responsible. And they're going to fix it because they have a lot of uh, lot riding on it. Instead of all these small e-commerce stores, and a lot of people probably have bad experiences with some small e-commerce stores. So you just have one portal, one account. If you have a complaint, they'll easily refund and it's super convenient. But also, if you search for a product, it's more logical that a marketplace pops up in Google because they're so big and a lot of domain authority. And then you're getting used to that platform. So it's just popping up. The price is okay, but there's comparison anyway. So you can just buy there. I do the same thing. I was searching up a warranty for one of the products I bought, and I was just scrolling through a massive list of orders just this year of a local marketplace. Just convenience. The app is there. You can even snap a picture and you immediately get the product. So it's just convenience and trust. It is. I, I completely agree with you. And if you look out over the next, say, 12 to 18 months for you guys, is there any sort of piece of functionality that you don't offer today that your customers are asking for that you will look to add? Or is there something internally that you say, hey, we don't do this today, but we see it as important. We think we're, we're really keen to add this piece of functionality to our platform. Or even, obviously, you'll continue to add endpoints, both internal and external endpoints. But from a functional perspective, or maybe from a business logic perspective, what don't you do that you think you should be doing? Yeah, so, so we, like all other companies, have a massive list. Uh, we just launched functionality with AI to make it easier and more convenient. I'm a big believer in virtual bundles uh, because if you have a large inventory of products that are relatively cheap, it's hard to make a profit. Everybody's looking for profitability. And what we did is in Channel Engine, you can create virtual bundles just by selecting multiple items. We keep track of the underlying stock, but then there's an obstacle. It's, you have to create a title and a description. So now we use it with generative AI and we're about to launch a new functionality where you can actually create images with virtual backgrounds, lifestyle images within Channel Engine, also AI generated, just to make it more easy. And then there's a lot of other stuff uh, going to be rolled out just to make it easier to do categorization mapping and attribute mapping. You probably know what I mean, just connecting the source to the output which can be done by a machine. So we're, we're fine tuning that, launching it, and there's lots of more stuff coming. What we're working on in the background is more the intelligence. What do you want to stop where and why if you do global? And that's an interesting piece to nail. We're optimizing our pricing engine. So lots of stuff coming, basically to make sure a small team can manage many e-commerce sales channels at scale. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit you with one last or one of the, the last questions I'm going to ask. I'm going to hit you with an oddball question. When will we be talking to our software instead of using a mouse and a standard user interface? When will I be telling my software 
what I want to achieve. For example, when I go into zero today, and I use this example a lot because when I go into zero, I, it would be easier if I could just talk to the software and say, hey, I want to reconcile today. I want to do X, Y, and Z. This, this matches that. This is, if, if I could just have a conversation with the software, instead of having to click through a user interface into three levels deep within the navigation structure to figure out where something is that I need to, a task that I need to accomplish, if I could vocalize to it the rules that I want to put into place when certain things happen, do this, automate this. If I could have a two-way conversation with my software, this would make life a hell of a lot easier. My wife possibly wouldn't enjoy it so much when I'm in a home office and talking to my software all day. But, but why are we still using this 2D it's, interface to interact with software versus just having a conversation with it? It's there already but not widely spread. Uh, and we're looking at it as well. I know there are, uh, of course, like many others, we're experimenting with all kinds of AI tools where you can just talk to, you get the right answers, but we're also implementing it uh, into the, the reporting where you can ask questions and then get the right reporting back. And definitely these are the things on a roadmap, like creating product sets. It's a logic behind it so why don't you do that when you talk to it so it's definitely coming it's coming more and more and i'm a more of a believer in doing that to your software uh, instead of the voice control shopping like alexa give me some kleenex and then they recommend amazon branded items that's harder to do but for your software definitely it's getting easier and easier love it that makes me very excited about the future of software then because Half the time, the challenge of dealing with software is the actual interface itself. And I think if you can extract, and sure, we have UI, UX designers. That's what they specialize in, both in terms of e-commerce websites, but also in terms of UI, UX design for SaaS software. You have people that specialize in this and removing the friction. It almost feels like there's nothing more frictionless than just being able to have a normal human conversation with your software. It's already in a lot of chatbots, right? We have it in channel engines where we can just ask questions and it just shows up the, the best solution with a link to the help file and stuff like that. So it's coming. And luckily, the voice recognition is way better than it used to be because I, when I was in university, I had a roommate and the wall was this thin and he had the first voice recognition on his computer and all I heard was, down, no, right, yeah. up. Yeah. <laughs> so now it works better. Yeah, it's a lot better now. And how do you guys make your money? So you're a SaaS platform, and presumably yes. you, you've got that standard SaaS model where it's a subscription model. You pay a monthly fee. And I'm guessing it's a combination of maybe of catalog size, number of channels you connect to, number of transactions put through the system. So how do you guys price your platform? It's a, it's a SaaS fee depending on what kind of platform, what kind of regions you, you want to go in for enterprise. We have enterprise functionalities with a lot of audit logs and access levels for different roles and stuff like that. And then depending on the volume going through our systems. So you can imagine somebody doing a billion in GMV is charged more than somebody doing 50,000 of GMV. Okay, awesome. And we're now coming to the point in the podcast where I get to flip the script and hand the microphone over to you and let you ask me one question, any question you like, it be personal or professional. So Jorit Steins, what is your question for me today? For you to ask me? No, uh, for you to ask me. Oh, yeah. When, when will we meet? I'm hoping that you will be coming across to North America at some stage, whether it be a conference in the States or in Mexico. I'd love it, if, actually, if it was Mexico and we could go out and we could have some margaritas together by the beach somewhere. But, but yeah, look, I don't plan to be in Europe anytime soon. But look, it's so great to be back in North America again, to be perfectly honest with you. I'm going to a conference. I'm going to a conference of B2B Online Florida. I've just got back from San Diego. I'm going to a, a, a conference in Florida. And then it's looking like I'm probably going to be going and doing, at the end of this month, a speaking engagement in Cabo San Lucas. And that's all happening within one month, right? So San Diego, Florida, Cabo, and like... It's Trying to do that from New Zealand was going to be all but impossible. <laughs> and physical in-person experiences are definitely kicking back off again. I can tell that our world, our space, our industry has been craving that. 
And for me personally, I love the in-person environment, not so much because I learned things that I couldn't learn through Google or YouTube. It's, connection. it's the yeah. human connection that literally, I've loved this conversation, don't get me wrong, but if you and I could sit down and have dinner and or a beer together, it would be a totally different experience than something mediated by Riverside FM. And so there is a human energy that is just irreplaceable at this stage by technology. And to me, that is what our industry is all about. In fact, how I built my career was through the people that I knew. Like it, it yeah. was literally, I could not do what I do today without the amazing people, friendships, business partnerships, mentors. I, I just could not do what I do today without all the incredible people in my life professionally that in many cases have turned into personal friends as a result of that initial business connection. And it's, it's just completely irreplaceable, the personal touch. T totally agree with that. That's why I say we're not just connecting systems, we're connecting people. I'll be in the States uh, early November in January for a couple of conferences. So uh, let's make sure we, we stay in touch and uh, meet over there. I look forward to it, my friend. Now, how do you like people to get hold of you? I will put the link to Channel Engine and to your LinkedIn profile in the show notes. But yes. how is the easiest way, the best way for people to go to hold of you? Do you like them to just go to the Channel Engine website or to your LinkedIn profile or how, LinkedIn how do you prefer? profile, typically the easiest. And you can also follow Channel Engine on LinkedIn, but you can always reach out to me. Fantastic. Jort, I've really enjoyed this conversation. It Likewise. has been a lot of fun to travel down the memory lane of e-commerce for those of us that have been been given a few gray hairs by the e-commerce industry. This has been a lot of fun. I really appreciate it and can't wait to speak to you again soon. Are you a B2B or D2C e-commerce merchant? Then head over to greenwoodconsulting.net to learn how we can help you scale your business.